pollinators. They are the reason flowers exist. They are the reason fruits, berries, nuts, and many seeds exist. They are the reason we exist. I know not many of us think even one time about a pollinator on the daily. Wait, the butt. The big butt. We really should. In many cases, the first reaction we have to a pollinator is to be scared. I mean, it can certainly be scary. Especially if you receive a sting. Down. Ah! Okay, he's injecting right now. Remember, push down his abdomen, so... He's telling me probably... There's the big butt again, but not all pollinators stink. While I would bet most people can appreciate a flower, the color, maybe the shape, in some cases the astounding complexity, but for so many people they're scared to plant flowers because they know flowers attract insects such as bees, various bees. For many people they have difficulty noticing the little differences in the hundreds of thousands of different buzzing bees and insects. In fact, if you're in the United States, the bee we usually recognize instantly is not the bee that we should hope to see in our garden. See, we've imported the European honeybee and adopted it through early education and doctrine and videos like Winnie the Pooh Bear. The European honeybee is considered a naturalized insect that plays a huge role in the success of many of those food sources we rely on. Those different foods we brought over from all around the world. Bees have been dubbed essential and so important because of this. However, when viewing the bee under such a small scope, we are unrealistic about the full story of bees. European honeybees are generalized pollinators. Let me make an analogy. Sometime way back, we would grow all the food we needed to sustain us. We advanced and we began to make other items that we invented. This was progress from the days of foraging. Then we barter, we set up shop, and now Amazon has shut down these family owned businesses right? We watched it firsthand. This happened so rapidly that we were able to see it under a fine scope. You know, like a narrow field of view. This is the kicker. We first developed a language. This allows me to speak to you. Then we developed a written language. We can now learn from the people of our past. We developed photos and then videos and then the YouTube app. And we all carry a smartphone right on our sides. Progress. We all live in different areas of the world. We all have different species that exist in those areas of the world. The astounding complexity would have never happened if it wasn't for the coevolution of both insects and plants. We all have a unique co-evolved ecosystem we're existing in right now. And while it's changing rapidly, there's things we can do to help. Let's talk about that big corporation, Amazon, but let's just call it the European honeybee. The pollinator that we cherish, the same one that creates fear, is not necessarily as beneficial as we're taught to believe. European honeybees are generalized pollinators. They collect nectar and pollen from every flower and they're really good at allocating resources that are constantly gathering from a multitude of different flowers. This depletes the available resources for the uniquely co-evolved pollinators starving them and while the European honeybee is gathering a variety of different pollen, the flowers it pollinates receive less pure pollen with a cocktail of different pollens from different plants. Each plant receives less pure pollen, and those specifically co-evolved pollinators receive less pollen and nectar from their mother plants. Compared to many of the native pollinators, honeybees are like giant bodybuilders. They're much larger than most of the native insects that are grown to pollinate these flowers. They just muscle their way in there and take almost all the resources. And native plants are now producing less seeds than before. What's the consequence? The price we're paying and we don't even realize it. Let's look at it at a broader scope. If we cherish these bees on a higher level than the natural native pollinators, we will be allowing Amazon to shut down the mom and pops of our animal kingdom. A consequence we have yet to see. We will be completely dependent on one species. Maybe this analogy is a little ahead of its time. That's something only time can tell. I certainly don't want to find out. All right, now I want to answer a question from one of my subscribers. The question was, why Justin Smith doesn't include scorpions in his research on stinging insects, noting that scorpions are not actually insects. Well, I can't speak for Justin Smith. What I could gather was that Justin Smith started his sting pain index as a thesis for his studies in chemistry. He received a sting from a carpenter ant, a different kind of pain. He was puzzled. 
He said, that's chemistry right there. Like some people who are just a little ahead of their time. He saw the value and the uniqueness he experienced from the carpenter ant sting. I guess he felt, why let a good pain go to waste? He realized there was a use case in classifying the intensity of stings. He intended to classify the stings of wasps that were commonly found in the workplace. That's where it started. And eventually, he classified around 80 different species of both social and non-social wasps. Schmidt did not include spiders or arachnids, which is where the scorpion is classified. I guess the simple answer is, nothing is everything. I so often wanted to travel to test the stings of some of the most notorious insects. I aspired to take a sting from the bullet ant, even the Japanese giant hornet. However, my journey started small. I wanted to test the sting of the cow killer. Feel the sting. Fear not. Oh gosh. Oh, her sting was lodged. Wasn't really sure why. I mean, I was scared for sure. I did take that sting many years back, and since, I have been testing the stings of nearly every Florida wasp species. At first, many of the species were the ones I would encounter commonly. The yellow jacket, I remember being swarmed countless times unexpectedly. Oh, may cause harm. Oh, then some of the more common species you might see under roof eaves, the metricus wasp, the red paper wasp, guinea wasp, the massachitardus wasp, you know, the executioner wasp little sidekick. But there was more to stings than flying wasps. They're solitary wasps, from the twig ant to the cicada killer. And there was a notable difference in the pain that was created from these solitary wasp species, like the metallic blue black widow honey mud dauber species I tested. Feeding on one of the most feared insects in North America, the black widow. This, my friends, is the infamous black widow. It is a specialized hunter. It is a solitary wasp, so it is a spider wasp, like other mud dauber. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a sting there. Okay, I would I say, I have to agree with Justin Smith. He was right, social wasps like the Metricus wasp or Pelestes major, the closest relative to the executioner wasp, their sting was more painful than those of solitary wasps. However, in the case of the cow killer, this was not the case. It seemed to be the worst thing of them all. While Justin Smith's ah. pain sting index classified several species of wasps from all over the world. I thought a more specific index for the southeastern United States, with the central hub being in Florida, could be useful as well. My index would cover many wasps that Schmidt never tested. In fact, I think me and Schmidt only overlapped like two times in the index. Even our cow killer were of different species. And in my index, I wanted to classify some of those other stinging species, you know, scorpions and caterpillars as well as the social and solitary wasp species like Justin Smith was doing. Because my index covers a smaller territory than Justin Smith's, I can include different species that he never had the time to. In turn, my index would be a little more inclusive for those people who do go to Florida or the southeastern United States. I would also cover the Florida centipede. Oh yeah, there it is. While my index still remains incomplete, I do intend to finish it, but there's still a few species I'm waiting on. If you want more insight on what those species could be, you should click on this video. And I hope you had a great time here in the great outdoors. I'm your host Alex, the Florida Wildlife Guy. Peace.